lesson today is Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For if you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, my right hand upholds me, and your right hand upholds me. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full, of court, in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus, who, though he is in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as, some, as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel affirmation. Great uh, lesson from the Old 
Testament uh, from the book of Deuteronomy and, and Jesus' uh, take on uh, that lesson. And so let's begin as we have been by reciting the Shema uh, together. It's on the screen if you don't know it. Um, if you don't know it, then I encourage you to memorize it. All right, here we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your spirit. And second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So what does love look like? It's kind of odd that we can, uh, we can talk about love for us to maybe study about love. It's uh, easy for us to read about it, to, to teach it, to admire love. But uh, what does it actually look like? Well, uh, today we're looking at love um, as one who serves. Love serves. And so today we're looking at servanthood. I mean, when we uh, go to church, uh, it's the same thing. We're deeply moved by all of Jesus' words about uh, serving. And, uh, and I did this, and I was just amazed, amazed about how many times the word servant, or so you can Google that, uh, or go to Bible Gateway, how many times the word servant or servanthood comes up in scriptures. It really is amazing. I wish I had a, a number for you. But it, uh, it is amazing how many times that word shows up. So we go to church and we're deeply moved by what uh, the Old Testament says about serving. Or, or um, we want to champion what Jesus says about, about uh, serving. And, and, uh, and then you know, we, we realize that we're all about serving. You know, uh, pro-serving, we're all going to serve except when it comes to action. Serving others, then, then it seems like we have trouble with it. So uh, today we're going to talk about what it means to love through servanthood. And when we when we serve, and, and there I had some I had some props, shoot, okay. but the back kind of distracted me a little bit. I, I, I do have some I have some props about serving because uh, we have things around us all the time, tools, right? I mean, the key to doing a good job is having the right tool. Right? And there are tools to remind us of what love looks like. Love serves. And so you, you go around your house, you know, I'll be right back. <laughs> you go Serving the poorest of the poor. And you know what she said? 
She didn't say, I do it for greatness. I, I do it because I want to become famous, though she has become famous. You know what she said? She said, I do it because it brings me great joy. It brings me great joy to serve. You know, it's no longer looked like to her that she is doing something heroic when she serves. It's kind of like, I think, serving, it, 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 it's like when someone wrestles with alcohol. You know, there might be that first day of sobriety, sobriety for them, and, and they think, wow, this is a really, that, that feels heroic for them. I got through a day without, without drinking, and, and uh, they might think about how unusual that is for them not to drink. Uh, and, and it's heroic for them to remain sober for a day. But then after 20 years of sobriety, they don't think of it nearly as much. They're free to think about more important things in their lives. Now sobriety is, uh, looks just kind of like sanity uh, for, for them, for which they're grateful. So, so servanthood kind of looks like this. We don't do it to become great. We don't, hey mom, you know, I'm clean, I, I cleaned up the dishwasher, right? We, we just do it because uh, if, if we do it long enough, like Mother Teresa, it changes us and it brings us, it brings us joy. So love serves and love looks for chances to serve. Here's the deal, where there is a serving problem, then there probably, right behind it, is a loving problem. Where there is a serving problem, then there's going to be a loving problem. So Jesus is teaching his disciples about the importance of loving servitude his whole life, and, and then um, right to the very end. The scripture tells us that his disciples and Jesus were gathered in a room, and Jesus knew that it was going to be his last day before he would be handed over to the authorities to be crucified on the cross and to die. And, and, uh, and there is a problem of serve, serving that comes about among the disciples. And it has to do with foot washing. The disciples said, well, whose job is it to wash the feet around here? You know, uh, the disciples thought that maybe they were beyond washing each other's feet. And certainly Jesus was beyond washing each other's feet, you know. So they were asking, well, there's got to be a foot washer around here, right? I mean, uh, it's not going to be me. Do I have to do everything around here? You know, uh, I'm not going to be the one that's doing the foot washing, right? And then this is what happens. This is at the end of Jesus' life. Uh, and, and by the way, in the ancient world, there is no record of a rabbi ever, ever washing the feet of his disciples, except in the Bible, except at the end of the story of Jesus' life. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, put a towel around his waist, he poured water in a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, and to dry them with a towel. Whose job is it? Jesus says, it's my job. That's my job. And then he goes on to say, now that I, your Lord and teacher, your rabbi, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus says, I have set for you an example what you should do. So, here's the question. Who are you going to serve this week? Who are you going to go to and serve this week? Last week, uh, for seven days, you were asked to do what? You were asked to say an encouraging word to someone. For seven days, same person. So, how many of you? How many of you were pretty successful in that? Raise your hand. An encouraging word, one day, uh, one word every day for the whole week. That, that's kind of a, that's tough to do, isn't it? It's tough to do. You know, I, I suspect that if it weren't so difficult to do, Jesus would not be commanding us to do these things, right? I mean, they would just happen. So Jesus commands us. Jesus also commands us to serve one another as Christ has. Us. So who are you going to serve this week? And I want to show you one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. It's, it's one of the most powerful and clearest places to see how servanthood is embedded in the nature of God. It's Philippians 2, what Becky read. And I'd like to show you how deeply servanthood is a, a part of who God is. So Paul is writing, and, and he uses this beautiful hymn. It's called the Christ Hymn. It's his dedication to Jesus.
to servanthood. So Paul begins in verse 5, and I think we have this verse up on the screen.
without wondering about it and maybe even being broken by it. That God is a servant. And then at the same time, to think about serving ourselves. That's what the awe and the wonder is all about. That you and I, that we would be people of impact and that we would serve others. Because seeing God on the cross, we also want to make a difference in the lives of those that are around us, in our families, in our workplaces, in our church, and in our communities. So I'm wondering how you're going to serve this week. I'm wondering what you're going to do this week to be a servant of this God. And I think we need to be careful here because though Christ calls us through his love to us to serve others in love, this does not mean that we are to be a doormat for others. So we need to be careful about this at the same time. And if you're in a relationship where you just feel that you're being used or being taken granted of, or it's not a full partnership, it will probably take some courageous conversations. Maybe a hard word that you'll need to say that we learned about last week. A word spoken in love. A truthful word spoken. So Jesus knew he had to break some stereotypes of servanthood. And the most prominent one in his day was that leaders don't serve. That was a big stereotype in Jesus' day. Leaders don't serve. They don't have to. They're too great to serve. They're here for others to serve them. That's what the people in Jesus' day thought. Thank goodness people don't think this anymore. Well, they do, don't they? Some leaders think that they are too good to serve. But Jesus talked about and he practiced servanthood as probably the most important for people in positions of power. Why is it, that, why is, why is it uh, that Jesus had to teach that? Because sometimes our egos get in the way, right? Sometimes our egos are so vulnerable to our pride. And so our egos get in the way. We think just because we're a leader that people ought to serve us. Well, Jesus fights against it. Getting to make calls for others can be a pretty heavy narcotic. So soon I can desire to dominate people simply for the sake of domination. I just get used to having my own way. I want to know that things are getting done because I have said so, right? Uh, you know, I, I walk into the office and the bulletins are done because I said so, right? Or I go, I go home and I walk into my kids' room and they're clean. Why are they clean? Because I said so, because I, because I told them so. I told them to clean their room. So it gets done because of my power, because of, of my leadership. Uh, I walk uh, you know, into my house after uh, the end of a long uh, work day, and, and the recliner is ready for me, the paper is waiting for me, there's a cold beverage near the recliner, and the slippers and the hors d'oeuvres are, are there Because I've walked into the wrong house. That's why. That's exactly why. Well, that, I've been thinking about that for a long time. All right, if the tendency says, I don't have to serve you, right? Because I'm a leader, because I have greater power than you. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. For Jesus, it's the other way around. I think another stereotype that is still around is that it's the wife's job to serve the husband and make him happy and meet the needs of the family. What's wrong with this? Well, there's nothing wrong with this, right? No, there's a, there's a lot wrong with this, right? But some people actually think that this is biblical. They think that this is what it says in, in the Bible. There's nothing biblical about this at all. Everything is wrong with it when you are the one that's doing all the serving and it's just expected of you and not appreciate, appreciated of you. So some people think that's biblical, but the Apostle Paul says, Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
and gave himself up for her. So it's a little difficult to get from Jesus' love to church by sacrificing his life for us to me being in charge always with the remote control. You just can't move in that direction. There are a few dynamics that I think of that will strengthen marriages more than to be a church where husbands joyfully and intentionally serve. So you wanna, might want to ask that question in your marriage. You might want to just think about that or in your relationship or maybe even in a friendship that you might just do something to serve and see what that does. You know what it will do. It'll make love grow in that relationship. It'll make love increase. It's guaranteed when you serve, it will make love grow. So now acts of service are not just about spouses and family. They are about where we live. They are about where we work. They are about our neighbors. Jesus asked who was the neighbor, right, in the gospel. Who was the neighbor to the man beaten on the side of the road? It was the one who showed mercy. The one who served the one in need. So this week, this week we're going to practice serving others. What could you do? Well, you could, you could wash somebody's car. You could, you could take somebody's car. You could, you could steal their car and fill it up with gas. You know? And then just go wash it for, for them. That's what you could do to serve. You know? And not make a big deal out of it. Just do it humbly. This week you could go with somebody to the doctor. Just drive them. Take them out for dinner or coffee afterwards. Just serve someone. You could run an errand for someone at work. You could ask someone at work, how can I help you? How, what can I do for you today? What can I do for you? And, and, and don't stop pestering them until they actually give you something to do that would, that would help them. Something that you might do for them in love. And there is no place where this serving is more important than in the church. The greatest among you will be your servant, Jesus says. So in our church, we want to be known for extraordinary servanthood. We want to love abnormally and serve extraordinarily. So, who are you going to serve this week? Amen. Our hymn is, Lord, whose love and humble service.